Hello and welcome to another Minotaur Zombie Review slash thoughts this time of The Evil Within. This will be a spoiler free review slash thoughts. I won't talk about anything story wise outside maybe the first hour or two to just give everyone a setup like usual. But yeah, this is a game that I've actually, I remember being pretty hyped about back when it was first showing trailers at E3 and that kind of stuff. And I remember quite a bit of buzz about this game for the simple reason that it was going to be Shinji Mikami directing it uh, at a new studio that he founded called Tango Gameworks. And for those of you who don't know who Shinji Mikami is, he is basically the father of Resident Evil. Kind of those original Resident Evil games, the survival horror, I'm not going to say the birth of survival horror because we go back to Alone in the Dark for that, but the guy who really popularized it. And this, so there was quite a bit of hype surrounding this game, I remember, and I was pretty all in, and I cannot for the life of me remember why I fell out of interest. I think it was because it received kind of, like, all right reviews at the time, like they were good, but they weren't outstanding, and I think I got distracted by something else, probably like Bioshock or something. But anyway, with The Evil Within 2 that came out the other year, I thought it was finally time for me to go back and check out this game, because it's something I've been interested in for a while. And I, it was, it felt time. It felt like a time where I really wanted a nice survival horror kind of game. And so, the story begins. And you play as Sebastian, a hard-boiled detective in the city of... I can't remember. Oh, crap. I can't remember the city name. It doesn't matter. You're a detective, and you have two sidekicks. You have your best bud, Joseph, who's been uh, your partner in detective cases for a long time, and kind of a new rookie named Kidman. And the game starts off, you go to this, basically, hospital and gruesome scene. You walk in, and there's just like a big crime scene, everyone's kind of dead. And you walk around, and all of a sudden, your characters kind of hear this high-pitched, like, noise. And everything starts going crazy. You basically end up in like a sewer place, and there's a guy, like, butchering meat in the background and you're like strung up by a rope and you're like what the hell is going on is sebastian going crazy is any of this real and that's basically the setup it's the atmosphere and these the atmosphere is pretty great i will say though i think this game was like heavily marketed to be like oh this game's gonna scare the pants off of you and at no point did i really find it scary Maybe a little bit, like, disturbing, and the environments are a little bit creepy-ish, but it's never scary. It's scary in the same way Resident Evil 4 is scary, in that it's kind of weird environments that are kind of creepy, and creepy monsters, but nothing that's gonna, like, outwardly, like, make you want to turn off the game. There was... I, I, the thing I always go back to from my childhood is, like, Resident Evil 3. I could only play that game for like, like Teenage Minotaur could only go play that game for like half an hour at a time because when Nemesis showed up and he's like, STARS, and shot a rocket launcher at me and chased me, my heart was pumping so fast like I had to turn the game off and come back to it later. I, I couldn't keep going. <laughs> and there is nothing like that in this game. It's very Resident Evil 4 in that aspect. And that's something that's like important to realize, I think, if you want to play this game. Don't go in expecting like an amnesia, dark descent kind of game. Now, as for the characters themselves, it's actually probably the most disappointing part of the game. The overall story is interesting up until about the halfway point when you figure out what exactly is going on. And I will tell you, it's probably not quite what you think it's going to be. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I like that twist. The problem is the characters are so bland. Sebastian might be like the blandest character I've played in a while. He has, I'd say he has no personality, but it's like beyond that. There's kind of like an abyss. Even, even the situations he's placed in, like grotesque monsters and weird environments and everything's trying to kill him. And he just seems like oblivious to all of it. He never really reacts like, oh my God, what's that? Uh, maybe it's because he's a hard-boiled detective who's seen some shit in his day, but I don't know. It, as a character, visually he is uh, like doesn't look anything all that special, which is funny because the art direction on everything else looks so good, but him as a character model, 
looks so bleh. And his personality is that it really feels like he has none as you're playing through the game. And most of the personality that they're trying to give him is through like this tragic backstory that you keep getting bits and pieces of in journals that you pick up, like his journals that he wrote, you know, six months ago, blah, blah, blah. And it's all written with such like a, this happened, but there's like no, it just feels like there's no feeling to it and nothing carries forward into his character as he is now where you're playing as him. It all feels very disjointed and <laughs> they keep it's like they keep pumping up this tragic backstory for him but it, it really has nothing to do with the main story it, it, like so little to the to the point where it's almost like they threw it in to throw it in like they threw in this tragic backstory just because they thought well crap our character has no story and he's not really having any character development development right now I guess we should throw this in just to like try and be relevant here and, and I really think there's a ton of missed opportunities uh, once you know the twist of what the story is. There's so many situations that should be showing up, that should be intertwined into the game um, as situations. It's, it's kind of like... How do I describe it? This is a good one. Okay. Think think of Max Payne, right? Think of, uh, think of his tragic backstory and how that's intertwined into everything you're doing. With his, with his wife and kid murdered. And you keep having these like weird dream flashback things where it's like it's tormenting him and you keep seeing like, you see you see the scene where his wife and kid were murdered and then it's all this surreal like dreamlike experience. This game, story-wise and everything, that's the kind of stuff that should be being shown related to his tragic backstory and none of that happens. Which is so strange, because it doesn't make sense from a story perspective, and it should be there. And it bothered the crap out of me. It's not necessarily that anything was bad, it's just it it bothers me that there are so many missed opportunities for it. The, the supporting cast, Joseph, is alright, and Kidman is actually pretty interesting, but we'll get into why later. But long story short, the story, the story kind of ends on a cliffhanger. It explains next to nothing. Almost everything is left as a mystery. Would not rec- if, if you're looking for a story, don't play this game. Because it's all about the gameplay. Very few things are tied up in the end and you'll be left scratching your head for a lot of it. The, the area- don't get me wrong, the areas and situations are interesting at, interesting at times, but none of it just like comes together very well and it just feels like it's all set up and no payoff. Which I guess, thankfully, there's an evil within, too. I'm sure a lot of that payoff will come there. But some of it's just nonsensical, man. But, you know, that doesn't matter because we're here for the survival horror, right? And what is here is classic survival horror, not in Resident Evil 1 through 3, but in Resident Evil 4. This game is definitely very Resident Evil 4. And it, it takes a lot of inspirations from a lot of different games. And... and it's very, it's very obvious. I mean, they, they have movie posters up on the wall, and you'll see, you'll see a pyramid head looking guy there, and you'll see uh, something that's kind of looking like Resident Evil. It's, it's not ashamed of it, because that's, that's where it's drawing inspiration from. The survival horror aspects are actually done really well. I absolutely adore Resident Evil 4. So that's kind of why I was looking forward to this game. And yeah, it scratches that itch. It's. N it's not entirely Resident Evil 4 in that you have to like plant your feet and you can't move while aiming. You can move while aiming and you have a lot more tools at your disposal, I guess you should say. Um, the weapons are all very basic. Pistol, shotgun, sniper, and magnum. Although the magnum may as well not even exist, man. Uh, I picked it up and it had like six bullets and I think I found like two ammo pickups the rest of the entire game. It was, it was basically like nine bullets the entire game <laughs> that that thing had. Maybe I just didn't find enough, but... Uh, and then the last weapon is probably the most interesting, which is the uh, Agony Crossbow. Which is just a crossbow, but you have five different ammo types for it. And it's pretty interesting. The thing is, the game starts off super strange. It's like they were just kind of throwing everything out at the wall. Like everything felt very... E3 demo-ish early on because they start you off you have no weapon Which is like ooh, ooh, that's pretty survival horror. That's weird 
But then there's this whole stealth system that they teach you right away, and you can just as stealth kill enemies as long as they're not looking at you. So what follows is like a really awkward forced stealth section throughout this village area at the beginning of the game. And the stealth is not fantastic in this game by any means. It's really hard to tell when an enemy's noticed you. And when an enemy has noticed you, it's like, it's over. There's there's no, like, trying to find another place to sneak. You you can try and, like, hide under a bed or something like that, but it's all it's all pretty tedious. The, the, uh, that entire section was kind of like, oof, I don't know if I'm feeling this game. And then I and then I got the revolver and I'm like, ooh, here we go. And then they do like a classic, you know, you know the one, the Resident Evil 4 village scene where it's like, oh crap, they're all coming at you. Uh, here's a bunch of different houses you can hide in, run around, try and survive. They do something kind of like that, and then the chainsaw guy comes out as if it wasn't Resident Evil 4 enough. And yeah, then the game started getting really fun. And from there on, it pretty much follows that. It, the stealth exists, but you probably won't even use it much after that. It's like, it's like even the developers are like, yeah, that part didn't work so well. <laughs> the thing I really like is that the game's a challenge, even on normal difficulty. Uh, I, I died quite a few times. The enemies are threatening, uh, and the checkpoints aren't super frequent, which I appreciate. I know some people are like, oh, that sounds annoying. It's, I gotta say, with, with most modern games giving you a checkpoint every every two minutes, it's kind of refreshing to, to feel like, oh, I messed up. I'm gonna have to do that part over again. Uh, but I me that's because I messed up. Uh, the game does have, like, quite a few random, like, insta-kill death traps, uh, but they usually do give you a checkpoint before they start throwing those at you. They're usually really random. Almost like, why did you throw this here? Other than to be like... Well, I, I feel like the player hasn't had a quick time event in a while. They're never really quick time events, but it's kind of like, oh, you weren't supposed to walk there, you idiot. So yeah, the uh, the gameplay all flows really well. There's an upgrade system that I think is actually done really well in that your currency, which is like some green brain gel fluid, is limited enough to where you can't just buy everything you want right away. And most of the upgrades are also enticing enough to where it's... It's not that problem of I buy all the ones that are useful right away, and then at that point, once I have all those out of the way, I'll just, you know, everything else is like really barely beneficial. It doesn't really have that problem, which I think plagues a lot of like progression systems like this. Uh, it was pretty fun, and I didn't have every, I didn't have all the upgrades I wanted by the end of the game, which is a good thing. You shouldn't have everything maxed by the time you beat a game. There should be some choice involved, otherwise the progression system means nothing. The Agony Crossbow in particular, well, let's, so far, the gameplay is, is pretty good. Uh, the bosses are fun, uh, box head, there's, there's a, there's a boss who has a box for a head, trying really hard to be pyramid head. He, he was pretty interesting. The bosses in general. There's the, there's this part where there's a boss that you can't really quite kill, and so it's chasing you, and it's kind of like a run for your life kind of thing until you finally get to an area where you can kill it. Most of those situations are really, really fun. I, I, I really did enjoy the gameplay of this game, even if the characters and the story weren't really bringing, bringing their A game. Uh, I, do have, I do have some nitpicks, though. Namely, it's like... It's funny, it's a lot of it's like menu UI stuff. The Agony Crossbow, it, for example, is very cool. But you have five different ammo types. And at least two of those ammo types do practically exactly the same thing, and they probably could have been condensed into one. And the problem is, is it's one button to swap between all five ammo types. And so when you have app, and so when you have ammo types of each one, it's so easy to accidentally cycle past and then go to the next one, and then you gotta cycle all the way through again. And in a in an intense survival horror game like this, messing about with trying to select which ammo you want is not fun. And it makes it even worse because it's not consistent, because it'll skip over ammo types that you don't have any ammo for anymore. So all of a sudden, the, those three X button presses to get to your shock, shock harpoons will now be two. And so you're gonna overshoot constantly. There's no consistency. And it's and there's kind of a crafting system and it's really simplistic, which I like. It doesn't get in the way. That's the other thing. Ammo is like appropriately scarce in this game, which I really appreciate. The game offers a good challenge and you can't just use the shotgun the whole game because you're gonna run out of shotgun shells. 
you're actually going to be swapping between weapons fairly frequently, which is big thumbs up in my mind. That's important for a game like this. Something that uh, that Resident Evil 6, for example, really failed to realize. But anyway, so the Agony Crossbow, it's, it's super awkward to cycle through those ammo types. And even selecting weapons in general is done through this really weird wheel. Um, I shouldn't say weird, most games employ it, but the problem with this game is that the positions of these weapons keeps changing and the game doesn't entirely pause time, it just slows down when you're in this. For example, it starts off, you'll have one weapon in there, you'll get the handgun, handgun there. Makes sense. Get another thing, it moves those positions to accommodate the new item. Makes sense. The problem comes from when it's like, well I ran out of grenades and rather than keeping the grenade indicator on that wheel at zero, it removes it entirely and shifts everything around again. And so now I have to take an extra two seconds to look at everything as like, okay, where's my shotgun at now? Uh, and it's just really annoying. <laughs> Things like that could, just felt like they could have been handled better. Uh, there is a really cool mechanic actually where the enemies don't like fire. And so you, you get matches throughout the game and if you like shoot their leg, because normally it's all about headshots, right? Um, but sometimes the enemies will have like a mask or something and so instead it'll be more beneficial to shoot their leg and knock them to the ground and then you can pull out a match and throw it on them and they'll burst into flames and die and that's also pretty awesome. There's, there's a decent amount of variety for a game like this actually uh, in that the enemies aren't super diverse but the ways you can dispatch them are to a certain extent. It all just feels very nice. Uh, the game clocked in around 15 hours for me, which maybe is a little bit longer than it should have been Because while it was really fun, it, it was dragging on a little bit towards the end, but Overall, if you're not caring too much about the story or interesting characters uh, And you're just looking for like a nice Resident Evil 4 style game Check it out. It's it's a good time. It has its moments you know, this review could go on forever if I talk about every little individual thing. Is It has a few, like, random gameplay ideas that they'll just throw in every now and again that won't work super well, like the stealth. Or for a while, they'll have a companion around, and I wouldn't say it's, like, full-on escort mission. But it's certainly not all that fun, either. Um, because he can die, and he will die, unless you basically taunt the enemies over to you. And so, it has its flaws, but overall it was an enjoyable ride. I, I enjoyed it. It was exactly what I was looking for at the moment. Uh, I was just really disappointed in the characters in the story. But then the DLC rolled around. Uh, and so the first batch is the consequence, or the assignment and then the consequence. And in these, you play as Kidman, uh, which was basically Sebastian's uh, rookie partner. I won't go into too much detail on the story because hers is... It, it runs parallel to Sebastian. It's what Kidman is doing while Sebastian is doing his thing. And first of all, it's best play this one after you finish the main game. Uh, otherwise, the story is going to make extra no sense and you're going to miss the whole point. But these two DLCs combined last about five hours or so and you play as Kidman the entire time and it, it's showing you her story running parallel with Sebastian, but the thing is, is her story is so much more interesting on every level. First of all, we actually get explanations for most of the story things that are like left to ooh, spooky mystery and Sebastian's plotline. So you'll actually get some payoff for like the 20 mysteries that the game brings up. You'll actually understand what's going on and Kidman has Kidman herself is a far more interesting character with a more believable backstory that plays into who she is as a character today, like as you're playing her, as you learn about her backstory. And the funny thing is, is you get more Sebastian personality in Kidman's quest than in Sebastian's quest. Because you'll get to see some of the Sebastian flashbacks that set up his tragic backstory, and now all of a sudden he has flavor and personality. And it, it makes a lot more sense. The problem with Kidman's quest is that it is 100% stealth. Uh, I, well, I shouldn't say 100%. They give you a gun for an action scene for like 10 minutes. Uh, and I think, that, I feel like they only did that 
because they accidentally gave her a gun uh, at some point in Sebastian's story when you came across her, and they're like, crap, we do have to give her a gun at some point when we run across that plot point. <laughs> and they just take it away right away. Uh, but, yeah, it's... The, the stealth is better in her quest because you can actually take cover behind things and it, the system is built around it. But it's also a bit too much stealth all in a row. Uh, her, her enti the entire DLC is very narrative focused, which I enjoy. It's actually told really well within the environment and the plot. Pretty cool. It's probably some of my favorite moments in the game. It's just broken up by all of these slow stealth sections uh, where you just, you know, hide and try and avoid enemies. And it's not the good kind of stealth either. Um, it's, it's very linear, and I... Linear is not, like, inherently a derogatory term, but it's all very linear in that there's only really one way to sneak, a pa sneak past this foe. It's like, here's the room, you have one option. You, you don't have, like, a few different options to sneak past. Here's your one option. You hit that switch on that end of the wall, and it makes a sound, and that lures him away, and then you can move on. It's that kind of stealth. And, and the thing is, if you get seen once, it's so freaking tedious to, like, disengage and like try and return to a stealth mode you know it's 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 hard to get that alarm counter to go down metal gear solid style because they'll just rush you forever if there's a lot in the room and the problem is is sometimes the the way the game systems are designed and how you can sprint sometimes it's almost easier to just sprint past the enemies and try and avoid them that way um there's at one point there's like an enemy is like here's a room full of explodey enemies and i was like okay I just sprinted up next to a few of them and like brushed across them and sprinted away before they exploded and then they just killed themselves. It's like, ooh, now I don't have to stealth that. Ooh, that, that saved me time. So yeah, Kidman's story is absolutely worth a playthrough. Uh, I don't say that too often about DLC, but this is something that really felt like it should have been in the main game. Like you should have, you should have swapped to Kidman's side partway through Sebastian's side. Not only because it actually makes the story feel satisfying, but also because the gameplay sections would have complemented each other perfectly. The, the main problem with Kidman is that it's too much stealth all at once. It's all bundled together. There's nothing really to break it up all that much. The problem with Sebastian is sometimes there's too much action and it's just gunfight after gunfight, and sometimes it'd be nice to have something break that up. It would have been excellent if they could have weaved them together somehow. Uh, into one cohesive game uh, but unfortunately they were split apart but I will say as far as DLCs go if you're actually interested in the story and you care I, I don't know if all of it gets explained in Evil Within 2 anyway but if you do care about the story and you're just playing Evil Within 1 I mean that's like mandatory playing because 75% of the story is, is in that DLC uh, and then the last DLC is the Executioner and, you know, I wasn't even going to play this one because it seemed like a side bonus mode. But then I, I hit new game and I was like, ooh, this is, this is weird. First person, you say. Playing as Boxhead, you say. <laughs> I was like, well, I'll play as Boxhead. I'm sure he must have been a fan favorite boss from the game. It's a really throwaway game mode. It feels like some developer's pet project that he was working on in his spare time. And uh, one of the higher ups walked along and said, what, what, what is that? I was like, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I was working on this weird first person mode in my spare time. I, I'll get back to work on the real stuff. And he's like, we should make that into a DLC. Because <laughs> uh, that's really what it feels like. It it feels uh, pretty, pretty cheaply put together. It's all just recycled areas. And it's, I guess it's kind of wacky fun. It's fun for about five to 10 minutes, but the gameplay never evolves. And it's really not all that interesting. The story is like pointless. And it's everything about it's kind of clunky. You get all of these weapons and these upgrades, but they all feel very tertiary. Like they barely mean anything. And at the end of the day, this this DLC feels very throwaway. You you can feel all right if you boot this one up, spend five minutes, and you're like, wow, uh, I'm already not having fun. Just quit it there. It it doesn't get any better. If you're not having fun within the first five minutes of that one. Just let it go. Um, See, so yeah. That's the evil within. This went on longer than I thought it would. Jeez. I had a lot of fun with it. It has its problems. But if you're looking for that Resident Evil 4 style experience, 
It's absolutely worth a look. I will say this. They do some weird graphic stuff. Uh, they like letterbox the game by default. And I remember this being a big complaint. I don't know why they do that, why they thought that would be a good idea. But thankfully, uh, I could turn that off, at least on the PC version. I just turned it off. Um, highly recommended you do that, because that letterboxing, I think they're going for like some weird film-style look. I don't know. But the game looks a lot better with that off. <laughs> so I, I'm looking forward. I'll probably check out The Evil Within 2. I'm hoping the story is better. I'm hoping Sebastian is an interesting character in that one, but I'm not holding my breath. But yeah, if you like the Resident Evil 4 style survival horror game, give this one a shot. It'll probably scratch that itch because we honestly don't have a ton of options for this genre. At least not anymore. You know, I, it's not as good as Resident Evil 4. I should preface that. It's, n it's not as good as that game. Very few things will ever be as good as Resident Evil 4. But it's, it's, it's a good substitute. If you guys have played it, let me know what you think in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until then, thank you guys so much for watching. Later, everyone.